Um, she really was just an amazing nurse and an amazing person. You're listening to the Stories Behind the Stars podcast. My name is Tatiana Fallon, and I'm your host. This podcast is run by the organization Stories Behind the Stars. This has nothing to do with Hollywood. We are telling the stories behind the stars that were given in World War II. For those of you who are not familiar, during World War II, when a service member was killed, the family received a banner with a gold star on it. We are telling the stories behind these stars. Our goal is to put them all 400,000 into a common database, which then we will build a smartphone app that will be searchable from any location where you can read the story behind the star and you can really come to know the individual that died on D-Day and fought for our freedoms or the individual who's doing their job on the home front and died in a plane crash. This podcast is dedicated to telling those stories as we find them, as our researchers are doing this amazing research. You'll hear from researchers who are all volunteers from all across the country, and you'll hear their story, what brought them to the project, and then also the stories that they're finding. This is amazing content, and I really hope you enjoy this adventure. In today's episode, we have the opportunity to hear from Lee Snyder. She's one of our volunteers here at Stories Behind the Stars, whose personal project is to highlight the women who were killed in World War II. She's doing amazing research and has some great content. So excited to hear about it today. This week, I had a new experience in my research on women who lost their lives during World War II. I got to write about a woman Marine. I know there were Marines who lost their lives during the war, women Marines, that is, but I haven't been able to find a list of them. So this is the first woman that I came across. It's really interesting that during World War II, the women's divisions of the armed services had nicknames. For example, if you were in the U.S. Navy and you were a woman, you were a wave. That was their nickname. So it, and Army, if you were in the Army, you were a whack. Well, in the Marines, I wanted to find out, well, what, what were women in the Marines called? And what I learned was the women Marines were established last. They were a little reluctant to add women to their members. So there were uh, women in the Coast Guard, the Army, and the Navy before the Marines did this. So at the time the Marines finally decided they needed to have women, the Navy Major General Commandant, Thomas Holcomb, he said he ruled out all nicknames. During an interview, he was asked, well, what are you gonna call the women? And he said, they are Marines. They don't have a nickname. They don't need one. They get their basic training in a Marine atmosphere at a Marine post. They inherit the traditions of Marines. They are Marines. What did the U.S. women Marines do, like, for the most part during the war? Do you know? Women Marines were assigned to cover 200 different jobs, from parachute rigger to cook to aerial gunner instruction. Even though they were reluctant and the last to add women, by the end of World War II, 85% of enlisted personnel assigned to headquarters of the U.S. Marines were women. Wow. That's, so they really were basically running the, sh the show, but like, you know, the men were in the front lines, but they were running the operation. Yes, that's correct. And um, women, of course, stayed in the Marines after the war, the Marines continued to have women. And one of the interesting things that I read was there were not special um, training facilities developed for women, sort of like the general said, they're Marines, they're trained like Marines. So they used their existing training for Marines and put the women through it instead of developing a female program. That is amazing. That just tells you the caliber of those women. I don't know if I could, I would not make it through that training. So Helen Flukey was the first woman that I wrote about who was a Marine. And she in, went to Michigan State Normal College. I think she was studying to be a teacher. 
But at some point, like a lot of the college students of the early 1940s, they felt the call to do something to help with the war effort. So she left college and she was a defense worker. And then after being a defense worker at some point, actually in August of 43, she decided she would enlist in the United States Women's Reserve for the Marines. Once she enlisted, she ended up being in several different places. She was in Chicago, and then she went to Cherry Point in North Carolina, and then she ended up going uh, to train with Squadron 29 of the Marine Aviation Department in Norman, Oklahoma. And finally, uh, about a year after she's in, she ends up serving at in Santa Barbara at the Aviation Women's uh, Reserve Squadron Number Two. So here she is, away from home, and she is living all the way across the country from where she was born. And one day, she's uh, at on the base, and she faints, and she does not regain consciousness. They call her family. Her mother rushes to an airport, and ends up being in one plane delay after another and arrives only to find out that her daughter has passed away. It was determined later that she died of a cerebral hemorrhage, which is a devastating stroke with great mortality rate. And she was 22 years old. I know she was able to serve her country, but she died way too young. And I think sometimes we forget that um, sacrifices come in all sizes. Not everyone who went um, overseas survived, and not everyone who served stateside survived. There were a lot of sad stories for these families. And I, I, I think about that mother who got that phone call about, you sent your child off into the military, but you feel fairly comfortable because they're serving in the United States. They're not in a war zone. So how unexpected it would be to get that call that you're, you know, and find you've lost your daughter. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's a really cool story just because I feel like we don't really know when we think about World War II and you, especially when we teach World War II history, we just talk about like, oh, this event happened and here's what happened at Guadalcanal and, and here's the sequences. But we don't learn about like, this is how they were able to be effective at Guadalcanal is they had people who were running these behind the scenes, getting, you know, logistics taken care of and, and all that had to be done by someone. And yes. people, I, you know, don't really realize like if I, in order for me to put a man at the front line, I'm going to have to have 20 people behind him to supply him fuel and ammunition and, and food and, and then supply, you know, all those things. And that's just, you know, logistically a nightmare. Um, which is maybe why they push so hard for women to get involved near the end. Cause we're really good at <laughs> managing like logistical nightmares. I feel like. <laughs> I, I, I can't disagree with that. <laughs> Well, thank you for sharing that with us. This has been really awesome. This, um, the stories that just are lost and so full of amazing, rich history. Thank you for listening to the Stories Behind the Stars podcast. Do us a huge favor and find us on whatever podcast platform you listen to and follow us. So you'll be the first to be know when we have a new episode out. Thank you.